so this morning we will be polishing off the book of Philippians. Uh, so it's our 20th session, making our way through the book of Philippians. We did it in 20 sessions, which I'm happy with that. That works. Tried to go quick. You're like, quick? I, I tried. That was my effort. I didn't say I succeeded. So yeah, so this morning we are going to be talking about a variety of topics. Um, among them would be like investing, this kind of concept. So so John, Zoe, you guys have been here for like, what, hundreds of sermons, right? How many sermons have we preached about money? Zero. Yeah. Well, we only cover it when it comes up in the text. So today, the, it does come up in the text. So we'll be discussing that among other things. And so we're going to talk about it in the context of like investing, because the reality is we are all investors. I don't know if we all recognize that, but we are all definitely investors. And when it comes to successful investing, you know, having foresight, that is being able to accurately predict or anticipate something is obviously of tremendous importance. You know, if early on you knew Apple would one day be one of the most valuable companies in human history, you would probably invest accordingly, right? There's that one story of one of the guys who was one of the <laughs> partners in Apple at the beginning. He's like, yeah, this is going nowhere. I, he sold all of his stock. <laughs> and uh, was Wozniak or something? I can't know. I don't remember which. Was it that guy? Yeah, one of the guys, right? And he today would be like one of the richest men in the world. But he's like, yeah, that's going nowhere. Personal computers, Psh, please. So, yeah, I mean, foresight. You, uh, you have it or you regret that you don't, right? Investors... You know, they devote considerable amounts of time and energy and money in trying to get a read on things, right? In trying to figure things out. They want to have insight into which stocks, you know, which companies will be good investments going forward so that they can buy these stocks. You know, they want to know which stocks, which companies are going to have poor performance so they can either avoid those stocks or if they're wise investors, you know, they can place put options or they can short those stocks and make money off of those companies doing bad. So either way, you want to have insight, right? You want to know which stocks are going to be a good choice, which ones are going to be a bad choice, and then you'll invest uh, accordingly. And the same holds true for the Christian life, right? There are things in the Christian life that are good investments. There are things in the Christian life that are uh, poor investments, unwise investments. And since we're all stewards of the resources that God has given us, then this kind of topic is very important to us because although we never talk about money and we don't ask for money and none of us get paid and we don't have a tithe box or a donation link on our church website or anything like that, uh, you will one day give an account for what you do with your money. And so, you know, if you don't recognize that, that's going to be awkward when you stand in front of God because the Bible very clearly teaches that. So we want to be diligent when we talk about these things, you know, as a pastor, I have to tell you guys what God's word says, and this is it, unvarnished, here's what it says. So that's one of the topics we'll be talking about this morning. You know, every year, hundreds of billions of dollars, conservatively, probably more like trillions of dollars, are made and lost, you know, based upon having knowledge and having foresight and insight in these kinds of things. You know, as Christians we will all stand in front of God. And he's going to require us to give an account of what we do with our time, you know, how we use our day, what we do with our time, our treasure, you know, our money, and our talent. God's gifted us all in different ways, some more than others, but whatever our, same with the money, right, or same with time, but whatever we do with those things is the issue, not how much of those things that we have. And that's an important thing to understand. Let's explain it this way. God gave you your gifting. So if you can sing really well, or whatever, right? Do you think that's because you're amazing? No, God gifted you with that. So God's not impressed by how well you can sing. He's impressed by how well you're using that to glorify him rather than to build your own kingdom. Think of Jesus with the temptations, right? At the beginning of his ministry, Satan comes to Jesus and tries to tempt him. And he tries to tempt him to use his, his giftings, in this case, his, you know, his deity, to benefit himself. That's Satan's goal. He tries to use, uh, convince Jesus to use his giftings, his skill set, to benefit himself. And that's what we see the temptation is for all of us, right? 
because God's gifted all of us with a certain skill set, uh, certain talents, certain giftings. What we're doing with those things is the issue, not how gifted or talented or rich or whatever we are. That's not the issue. God's not impressed by how rich you are. God's not impressed by how well you can sing or how well you can do this or that or the other. He's, he's impressed by what you're doing with those things to build his kingdom rather than your own. Because think about it. Jesus, he's like, Satan's trying to tempt Jesus. He's like, you know, churn this, you know, churn this stone into bread. Well, doesn't Jesus later essentially do that? He feeds the 5,000, feeds the 4,000, right? Well, why was the one sin in temptation and not the other? Well, because the one was for him. Use it to benefit yourself. That's what Satan was trying to convince him to do. Interesting, huh? So when you understand that, the temptation of this life is to use our time, our treasure, our talent to build our own kingdom instead of building God's kingdom, then you start to get an insight into that concept of stewardship and how we're all going to give an account one day. We're all going to stand in front of God. We're going to answer for how we've used our time, our treasure, our talents. And therefore, we should, as good stewards, want to get the maximum return on our investment, so to speak. You know, whether we're talking about time, you know, whatever time we're spending to build God's kingdom, we should want to use that time wisely. Whatever money we're using to build uh, God's kingdom, whatever money we're giving to build God's kingdom, we should want to use that wisely. And the same holds true with our talents, right? We should, as good stewards, want to make sure, want to make sure that we're not wasting our time and our treasure and our talents but rather instead using them wisely in our efforts to build God's kingdom. So if we're setting aside time to, you know, build God's kingdom, then obviously we want to make sure that we're using that time effectively. We're not just, you know, standing around doing nothing. The same holds true with our talents. You know, we want to use our talents in a way that's pleasing to God. If your gift is singing, should you just be singing in the shower? Or should you be maybe singing on the worship team or whatever, right? Trying to use your gifting to to bless God and to bless others. And I think that uh, makes sense. I think we get that. You know, the same with money. If we're using money, we don't want to just give indiscriminately because uh, otherwise we might just be using that money to pay some pastor's six-figure salary or to pay, you know, the rent on the, we've heard churches paying 40000 a month, these kinds of things. We heard of one that was uh, in a building the same size as ours. We were paying a quarter of what they were paying. They were paying 40000 a month. We had a giant building. We were paying like 11000 a month, and it was like 14 rooms. The sanctuary could fit 500 people. They had the same kind of size building, and they were paying 40000 a month for it. Like, that's probably not the best use of God's money. And then the craziest part is a lot of these churches, they use the, church, they use the building how many times a week? Once? Twice? At our church, when we had that massive church building for that church plant, we used it 27 days a month. Like, we put that sucker to work. <laughs> and so that's the idea, right? It's a necessary evil having a building, right? You, it's like, okay, got to play the game, got to have a place to meet. So, you know, we want to make sure we're using our our talents, our treasure, our, t- our time. We want to make sure we're using them wisely. And, you know, again, I'll point this out several times because I know people don't like talking about this topic, but we don't get paid. We don't have a tithe box. There's no donation link on our website. We don't care what you do with your money. But I'd be lying to you if I said God doesn't care either because God does care what you do with your money because money is the greatest, the biggest idol in this world. We call it the almighty, the almighty dollar. Is it almighty? In most people's hearts it is, huh? Tragic, right? People will do anything for money. It's crazy. You see the stuff going on in this world for money and people are selling their souls. They're selling their kids. They're selling their bodies. They're selling everything, right? It's insane. So we definitely want to not ignore this topic because we're talking about the biggest idol in the world when we talk about money. You know, Paul says he spent and was spent in the ministry of the gospel. We see very rarely Paul was actually being supported as a missionary. He spent his own money, right, and was spent, like poured out as a drink offering in the service of others. And if it's good enough for Paul, it's good enough for us. You know, so obviously we don't care about your money, but God does because we're all going to give an account. And the reality is, church, it's a privilege to be able to be a part of what God's doing by spending time and money and using our talents or gifting. And I would also point this out. 
Uh, a lot of people are of the mindset that, oh, I give my time so I don't have to give my treasure or my talent or vice versa. No, the reality is the Bible's abundantly clear. You don't get to decide which of those you get. It's not like pick one. You know, this is no, that's not how that works. You should be giving your time. You should be giving your treasure and you should be giving your talent. You should be using all of those things to build God's kingdom. So don't think it's like pick one. Like, no, that's not how this works. So we got to be using all of these things. You know, the Bible's clear. We should be doing all three, not just whatever one's easiest for us. David says, he says, I will not offer to the Lord that which costs me nothing. So the reality is whatever one you don't want to give, that's the most important one for you to be focusing on giving because that's where your heart is tied up. So if you don't want to give your time, you know, you're too busy, that's exactly what you need to do. You need to set apart some time. Like I said, you need to do all three. But if it's money, you're like, oh, I can't give my money. That's exactly what you need to be doing. Because at the end of the day, you're going to give an account. And if that's your idol, Jesus says you can't serve God and mammon, which is the God of money. You can't serve both. That's a scary thought, right? So we want to make sure we're being diligent about this. Obviously, the rich man wants to give his money because that's the easiest thing for him to give. He has a lot of it. He doesn't want to give his time. He doesn't want to serve and use his talents. Or the poor man, right, he wants to give his time. You know, the talented man, he wants to serve. But the reality is we need to be doing all of these things, not just the thing that's easy for us. And think about it this way, guys. It is a, it is a gift, it is something that we should not take for granted, being able to support the work of ministry. It's something that you will only be able to do in this life. You know, uh, we love the book. It's, uh, what's his name, who wrote the book, One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven? Cahill, yeah, Mark Cahill. He's got that awesome book, One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven, and it's talking about evangelism. You want to know another thing you can't do in heaven? Give to support the kingdom, right? That ship has sailed. You either do it here or you don't do it at all. You know, we get to be a part of what God's doing. Imagine being able to financially support Paul the Apostle in his missionary journeys. Think how crazy that would be. You get to heaven or, you know, going to meet Sousa and these other ladies who were the ones that paid for Jesus' earthly ministry. Imagine. You're going to meet them in heaven. You got trillions of years. Trust me, you're going to talk to everybody by the time this is all, you know, well, well established and on its way. You're going to have to talk to everybody. You're going to be like, Adam, what up, bro? This is a weird conversation. Adam's like, you guys are pathetic. I cannot believe, I should never have eaten that apple. Look at you decrepit little creatures. <laughs> He's like seven feet tall and beautiful. He's just like, what have I done? It's like looking down at like a small little puppy that got hit by a car. He's like, yeah, <laughs> sorry guys. <laughs> but we'll have time to talk to everybody, right? We'll have time to talk to these people that got to sponsor Paul's missionary journey or sponsor the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ. Imagine what an incredible privilege that was for those people, and that's an eternal legacy that they have. You know, or we come from a Calvary Chapel heritage. Imagine, you know, being the person that got to support, you know, Pastor Chuck early on in his ministry, you know, when he was just starting out at, you know, the churches before Calvary Chapel or whatever it was, right? So... The church in Philippi, they didn't have to imagine because they literally supported Paul in his missionary adventures. And so we're going to be talking about that kind of concept today and digging into that and fleshing that out here this morning. So as always, we will start by reading over the text. So we're going to be covering um, Philippians chapter 4, verses 14 through 23. We're just going to be polishing off this final passage here in Philippians this morning. So Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 14, Paul says, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, talking about his first missionary journey, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. 
The brethren who were with me greet you. All the saints and all the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And so that's how Paul uh, signs off his letter to the Philippians, reminding them to be diligent in this final thing and re, you know, re- recognizing that they have been diligent in that final thing. So we'll start with verse 14. Paul says, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. While reading 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, we learn that Paul and the church in Philippi were treated terribly. I think the exact words are shameful or outrageously. They were treated just crazy by the people who lived in Philippi. The church did not get a warm reception there. It was under intense persecution. And Paul says that by enduring that persecution, they did well. And despite that persecution, the church in Philippi not only survived, but rather they even thrived. Because as we've talked about before, the enemy of the Christian life isn't hardship or persecution. It's comfort. It's when things are easy. That's why the American church sucks. Because we're so comfortable. Life is so easy. And so we want a church that'll cater to that, that'll make us feel good. Because everything else in our life feels good. You can't come just on Sunday morning and get beat up. You're like, oh, everything in my life is good and easy, except Sunday morning. That pastor always reads that book, which makes me feel terrible. Let's go find a church where they just tell us what we want to hear. And that's what most people do. You get these encouraging, uplifting messages by guys who have little earpieces and walk around the podium, and they're like, all right, let's hear it for this. God's like, the church in Iran is getting murdered wholesale, right? The church in China is getting their organs removed without anesthesia. And we have these motivational speakers standing up front trying to puff you up and make you feel good. Imagine when we stand in front of God. Imagine when they stand in front of God at the white throne judgment. Not the Bema seat, because most of them aren't Christian. It's a different religion. If it's not based upon this book, it's not Christianity. If we're just walking around trying to make people feel good and trying to lift them up and everything else, that's not the book. Read what the book says. This is our instruction manual. Think of the word Bible as an acrostic. Basic instructions before leaving earth. It should be our blueprint, our roadmap, and everything we do should be founded upon this. And if we're doing that, then we're not always going to have comfortable messages. Some of the messages are going to be hard to hear. And, you know, the reality is most of the church in the world throughout church history has come under intense persecution at one time or another. And you know what that does? It has a good fruit. It has a purifying effect. And we're going to talk about that because, like we said, the enemy of the Christian church, it isn't hardship. It isn't persecution. It's comfort. It's ease. It's fake Christians who give Christianity and Jesus a bad name. When discussing the different types of soil that are analogous to the different paths of those who respond favorably to the gospel message, Jesus mentions the the second type of soil, you know, right, the stony soil, and he says that it represents those who hear the word of God and immediately receive it with joy, yet it has no root in itself but endures only for a little while And when persecution or, excuse me, when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, it's God's word that they don't like, then what happens? They immediately stumble. They fall off. And so this sounds bad, but it's actually not all that bad because it's not easy. It's not comfortable to be a Christian. And therein lies the beauty of persecution. It purifies the church. What's one of the main reasons people don't like Christians? They say, I don't want to go to church. It's full of. Well, guess what you don't get in a church that's under persecution? Yeah. Things are really easy here. You know, we talk about, you know, doing life together and community and all these kinds of things. That's adorable. Imagine something so important. The Bible forgot to mention it. But when you're actually risking your life to come to church, You know, all the fake people, they're not going to be part of it at all. They're going to be falling off. They're going to be, you know, doing whatever they do. 
Only the real Christians are going to be part of it. And then we'll have that beautiful, sweet smelling aroma of a, a pure church that's on fire for Jesus. It's not what we see in the world, right? Most of the time, what we see in especially the Western church is a comfortable six flags over Jesus with a Starbucks in the foyer, right? Where they're literally selling coffee in the house of the Lord. I guess they didn't read what Jesus did when they were selling things in the house of the Lord. You know, at our church, we always give away everything for free and people are shocked. They're like, you don't want to charge me for this hoodie? You don't want to charge me for, you know, these stickers? You don't want to charge me for any of this stuff? Like, no. Did you read the Bible? Did you see what Jesus does when you start charging for stuff at church? Doesn't work out well for those who are doing it. And yet the church is usually a business. So you see a lot of that kind of stuff going on. But persecution, yeah, it sucks. It's rough. But the fruit is a beautiful thing. It's a good thing. And it makes for a pure church that's on fire for Jesus Christ. Because what? They've counted the cost. It's not a bunch of fake Christians who have everything easy. And that's rough, but it's beautiful. A pure church is a powerful church. And when you compare the letter to the Philippian church, to some of the other churches that had it quite a bit easier than the Philippian church, like, for instance, the church in Galatia or the church in Corinth, you see that the Philippians were doing pretty good considering, right? You look at what was going on in Galatia. Paul begins the letter and he's just like, have you guys so soon walked away from the Lord? You know, the, the letter to the Corinthians, we call it the church, the letter to the church of California because it's like, it's so, there's just sin, everything's insane. You're just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that's in the Bible. Yeah, it's in the Bible. Horrible things were happening in the early church and Paul's like, I cannot believe you guys. You guys are out of control in a bad way. And so, you know, things were easier in Corinth. They were easier in Galatia, but because of that, they were more comfortable and the church was having far more problems as a result. So Paul here talking to the Philippians, he praises their steadfastness in the face of persecution and not just their steadfastness in the face of persecution, but also their generosity. Take a look at verses 15 and 16. Paul says, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again for my necessities. When our minds think of Paul's missionary journeys, you know, we're... For the first time in history, the gospel begins to spread to the Gentiles in earnest. We tend to kind of like romanticize it, right? Like, oh, so amazing, just revival everywhere he goes. Paul opens his mouth and people are just like, oh, Jesus. And yeah, there was some of that, right? There was some awesome things, right? There's beautiful stuff going on there. You know, churches were planted. There was incredible fruit. There was miracles, you know, these kinds of things. And that wouldn't be wrong. That's, that's, that did happen. But the other side of that coin is the unimaginable opposition and persecution and little to no support from the churches or the Christians or the fellow workers for Paul's ministry journeys. You know, we always think of it in a, like a romanticized way. But when Paul describes it, when he's talking to the other churches, he says, there is a great and effectual door open to me. We just want to put a period there because it sounds so great. Yes, a great and effectual. It's one of those t-shirt verses, right? It's a mug verse. You're like, oh, that's great. And then the second part, nobody wants. They're like, and many enemies, much opposition. You're like, ooh, you can keep that part. I do not declare that. I do not claim that. But that's the reality, right? Those two go together. When there's a great and effectual door, there's also many adversaries. And we don't like to think about that, but that's the reality of the situation. It's a hard pill to swallow to consider that Paul, when Paul was going around and starting the early church in you know, the Gentile world, there was pretty much nobody supporting him financially as he did that. Think how insane that is, that Paul the apostle, everybody who heard about it, all the other churches, all the other ministry leaders, all the other Christians who heard about it, they did the math in their minds and they're like, yeah, that's a dumb idea. A personal computer? Yeah. No, I don't think anybody will ever want that. Those Gentiles? No, they're made for the fires of hell. That's what the, that's what the Jews believed oftentimes, right? No, oh, nobody's going to respond to that. Go preaching the gospel in Asia, which modern-day Turkey, you know, in Europe, southern, southeastern Europe, that's a dumb idea. Yeah, wow, okay. Talk about 
misreading, like getting a bad <laughs> reading of the room on that one, right? They're like, this is a dumb idea. So Paul had no support. Isn't that a crazy thought to think? You would think that it would be like everybody would be like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. You know, the Old Testament prophesied that the Jews would be a light to the Gentiles and that the Gentiles would come and worship before the God of Israel. This is it. It's happening. Because the Bible says that, right? Nah, they're just like, ah, that's a dumb idea. So nobody supported Paul in his missionary journeys. Think how insane that is. It's a pretty crazy thought when you think about it, guys. The Apostle Paul most of the time, had little to no support as he was out preaching the gospel and planting churches and all these other things because the other Christians, the ministers of the gospel around him at the time, you know, they, uh, in all likelihood, they made a inaccurate an inaccurate assessment of Paul's calling and his character and his ministry. So they didn't support his ministry. Crazy thought, right? They're like, Paul, I don't know. He's, if you look at the physical descriptions, they're like, he's short, bow-legged, has a hooked nose. This guy is an idiot. No one's going to listen to this guy. You know, at other times they're like, Paul, he says things that are hard to hear. At other times, complimenting him, uh, Peter's like, yeah, his things are hard to understand. (laughs) Yeah, nobody thought this would work out. They're like, this is a bad idea. This is not the guy for the job. And so they made the decision based upon the flesh. Who remembers the story of the Gibeonites in the book of Joshua? It's crazy. As I was just randomly reading my Bible a week ago, the Lord had me read that passage. And I was like, huh, interesting. Okay. I was like, what's the lesson for that? Not knowing that it would be right here. That's why it's so important that you guys do your morning devotions, huh? So with the story of the Gibeonites, right, we have... When they come into the land, Moses is like, all right, remember, continue the mission, you know, go conquer all these tribes in the land, otherwise they will conquer you. And as we've talked about, the areas that they did not conquer in ancient Israel are today known as Gaza, the West Bank, and Golan Heights. Huh. That's where Israel's fighting today, huh? I guess that's just a coincidence, huh? Don't worry, the Bible's all fake. Bet your soul on it. Good luck with that. So yeah, they they you know they have the mission: drive out the people of the land, get rid of them, right? Get everybody out of there. Else you'll start worshiping in their ways. You'll start burning your children in the fire to Molech and Baal and Ashtoreth and all these other gods that they worshipped. And so, all the other tribes in the land, most of them got out of there and didn't even have to. You know, there weren't even battles. God also sent in hornets. If you read the Bible, everybody makes it you know sound like it was just like they went in and killed everybody. And there was a lot of battles, and they did kill a bunch of people. But the reality is God was driving them out, and a bunch of people just boned out. They're just like, we're leaving. This is not a good idea. We're not going to stay here. We've heard what happened to the Egyptians. We've heard what happened to AI. We've heard what happened, right, all these different areas. They're like, this is, we're out of here. But one of the groups had an idea. They're like, we will go. And we will disguise ourselves from some, as some group of people from far, far away. And we'll try to make peace with Israel. And an interesting thing happens. It talks about how the children of Israel investigated their claims, but then it adds, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. Some of the dumbest things you can do in your life are when you think you got it all figured out and you trust your your mental faculties and you're like, I'm smart. I got a good read on this. And you make that decision without asking counsel of the Lord. Notice I didn't say without praying. No, there's a big difference between praying and asking counsel of the Lord. You can pray about something and then go do exactly what you wanted to do. You know how I know? Because that's what we always do, right? That's pretty much what we always do. Asking counsel of the Lord is very different. That means you're going to be waiting on the Lord, expecting to hear from him, expecting to have him answer you and guide you and direct you. And as we read in Romans 12, 1 and 2, if your life is fully on the altar, you presented your body as a living sacrifice and you're not being conformed to this world, which is corrupting you and destroying you as you spend all day doom scrolling on uh, TikTok or Insta or all day on your Discord server or whatever. If you're not doing that, but instead you're being transformed by the renewing of your mind, spending time in his word, spending time in prayer, spending time in fellowship, If you're doing that, guess what? The Bible says you will know the good and perfect will for God in your life. 
And if you're not doing that, you won't know the good and perfect will of God in your life. And so that's why it didn't say they didn't pray. It said they didn't ask counsel of the Lord. And in our own lives, guys, we need to be asking counsel of the Lord in regards to how to spend our time, how to spend our treasure, how to use our talents. Because we see with the Gibeonites what happens when you don't. We see with the early church what happens when you don't. They looked at it, and they're like, Paul's an idiot. And guess what? Paul probably was an idiot. You know how you know? Because we're all idiots. That makes it really easy. Right? We think we're smart. We think we got it all figured out. Uh, Talk to your spouse. I'm sure they have a fairly long list of how dumb you are and the dumb things that you do and the ways you screw up 24-7. Because we all do. The Bible says there's no one that does not sin. We all fall short. Right? Some of us are better than others, but it's like polishing a turd. It's not an easy thing to do. That's why God doesn't just fix us up. We die in Christ, and it's now Christ who lives through us. So it's not like we get reformed and fixed up. No, we get killed. We die in Christ. Jesus died for us, and if we want to have that Christian life in the way that the Bible describes it, it means we lay down our lives. Colossians 3, 3 says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Oh, no, excuse me, Colossians 3.3 3 is the one that says, you died and your life is hidden in Christ in God. But the other passage says, it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live for the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. Isn't that beautiful? That's the gospel message, that through faith in Jesus Christ, we can have a relationship with him if we believe in his life, death, and resurrection, that he died on the cross to pay for our sins, and that through faith in him, we can be saved and have that relationship with him then we won't hear when we stand in front of him, depart from me, I never knew you. And it's not just like, oh, this Sunday morning thing, or oh, I wear a cross when I drink my beer and smoke my weed. No, it's you're a new person in Jesus Christ. That's why I'm no longer smoking seven grams of weed a day and drinking 40 beers, because God changed me. That's why Pastor Steve's no longer injecting methamphetamine, because God's changed us. And that's the beauty of having that Christian life, that it's not just a head thing or a heart thing. It's both. It's everything. And we don't just make decisions. We don't just pray for that rubber stamp of approval. All right, Lord, I prayed. Now I'm going to do what I already wanted to do. No, we ask counsel of the Lord. Lord, what do you want us to do? What do you want us to do in this decision? That's why Pastor Steve and I, we go do prayer retreats and we ask the Lord, Lord, what do you want us to do? And you know what happens? A weird thing happens when we do that. The Lord shows us what he wants us to do. Shocking. Wow. It's almost like God doesn't change, which is exactly what he says. I do not change. And so we need to be asking counsel of the Lord. We see what happens here. The early church, they did not ask counsel of the Lord. They just made that decision. Paul's an idiot. We're not going to support him. This is a bad idea. iPhones, who would ever buy an iPhone? You know, Apple computer, who would ever have a desktop computer? Or, you know. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, we think we've got things figured out, guys, and then we make bad decisions. You know, imagine the regret when these churches, these early church leaders and these Christians who knew Paul but decided to not support his ministry, imagine the regret when they got to heaven and then and only then did they finally see the true impact of Paul's ministry, which they declined to support. Billions, billions of people saved. What? Like insane, right? If they would have sought the Lord and not just prayed about it in passing, but actually sought God's counsel about it, they might have ended up doing that. Things might have gone very differently, but they trusted in their own assessment of the situation, and as a result, they missed out on the opportunity of a lifetime in supporting the most successful missionary ever to walk this earth. Crazy thought, right? You're like, well, I don't invest in anything. Sure you do. I guarantee you invest in quite a bit of things. Show me your, what's the old saying? Show me your wallet and I'll show you your idols. Like, uh, uh, getting too close to home there, church daddy. <laughs> your term, not mine. I don't, this is, you guys are crazy. This is what they call me. Church daddy, you guys are so bad. Church, you and I are faced with the same test as Christians, guys. Are we going to s- diligently seek the Lord? and do what he tells us to do by being a part of what God's doing here on earth? Or are we going to just continue building our own kingdom and, you know, 
being poor stewards of the resources that God's entrusted to us, you know, not being diligent, even if we do give, are we being diligent to make sure that we're giving in a way that's glorifying to God and using that money in a way that's wise? You know, we support ministries and the ones that we support, man, I 100% stand behind and I'm excited to support them. I'm like, yes, because I know what they're doing. And I'm like, dude, I get to be a part of that. Amazing. There's some good ministries out there. Very, very few. I would say it's like less than 1%, which is really depressing, but there's a couple. Praise the Lord, right? And so, yeah, we need to be diligent. We need to make sure we're actually supporting ministries that are preaching the gospel and making disciples and building the kingdom, not our own kingdoms. And again, again, we don't take an offering. None of us get paid. There's no tithe box on the table. We don't have a donation link on our church website. I'm pretty sure we're the only church on earth that has none of those things, but that's okay. Because we truly believe that as we grow in Christ, you know what will happen? People will want to give, and if they want to give, they'll find a way to give. If I, if you guys only give because I force you to give, did you give to God or give to me? God knows, right? Support whatever ministry God shows you guys to support. But don't rob yourself or rob God by failing to properly steward the resources God's entrusted you with. And that's the point that Paul makes in verses 17 through 19. Take a look at verses 17 through 19. Paul talks about this kind of concept. He says, not that I seek the gift. He's like, I don't want your money. Same thing I just said. I don't want your money. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. You guys are missing out if you're not giving. That's what he's saying. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphrodites the things sent from you. A sweet swelling, a, I keep sweet swelling, sweet smelling aroma to the Lord, to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. God's going to do his thing. And our disobedience and giving isn't going to thwart God's plan in the least. But it will mean that you will suffer loss of not just rewards, but also of fruit. That's like a Christianese kind of term. We talk about a ministry is bearing fruit when people are getting saved, disciples are being made, lives are being changed, these kinds of things. That's a crazy thought that there will be on you guys' account loss of fruits, loss of rewards for not doing what God's told you to do with your time, your treasure, your talents, these kinds of things. It's a crazy thought. It's beyond tragic. And even more incredible and amazing is that our financial gifts, according to what we just read, are a sweet-smelling aroma and an acceptable sacrifice, which is well-pleasing to God. So when we give money to build the kingdom, it is an acceptable sacrifice, a sweet-smelling aroma. It's well-pleasing to God. And if what I just said bothers you, you need to check your heart and repent, because that's God's word. It's a crazy thought, right? It's tragic because when most people talk about, most pastors talk about giving every Sunday, they uh, use that verse where it's like, press down, pack together, the Lord will give it back to you. They appeal to your greed. Isn't that crazy? Give, so God will give you more. You'll be rich. What? Like, no, it'll probably suck. (laughs) But you know what? God will take care of you. That's the promise there in verse 19, right? He'll supply for your needs. Your wants? No, your needs. You're like, I had to cancel my Netflix and my Disney Plus, so I'm no longer supporting the pedophile materials Disney put out. It's really, I'm really sad. Like, I couldn't get my $10 coffee at Starbucks. Like, yeah, you're probably better off as a result, right? And I hear, I get it, guys. This is hard. These are hard things to hear. But I'm required as a minister of the gospel to teach you guys not what you might want to hear, but rather what God's word actually says. Imagine a God so important to you, who you're so in love with, that you literally won't spend a dime on him. Is that the God you worship? Is that how you worship God? I get it. You don't like to hear this. How do you think that would work with someone you're dating, guys? <laughs> Gentlemen, how do you think that would go? You're like, this girl's amazing. Take her out to dinner. She's but take me out to dinner. What? Like, bring me some chocolates, woman. What? How do you think that would go? 
Ladies, how many of you guys want to date a guy who will not take you out to a meal? Go ahead and raise your hands if that's you. No hands went up. Yeah. No girls want that. Do you think God wants that? Where you won't even give him any of your money? You're like, that's my money. He's like, okay, I didn't give it to you or anything. It's not like everything you have, including your breath, is from me. Or you're like, I don't have any extra money. I spend everything I make, every penny I make. Perfect. Because David says, I will not give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. Like we sang this morning, pain in the offering. Yeah, it's not always supposed to be easy. Let's put yourself back in ancient Israel. Okay, okay, so now every time you screw up, you have to go take a lamb. Do you take your best one or your worst one? Oh, that sucks. You're like, dude, my flock is pathetic. <laughs> I am a dirt bag, so I've killed every nice animal I have. <laughs> I got these crippled things over here. These lambs are just pathetic. Look at these things, man. Yeah, you think that was easy? To go out into your herd and take the best thing you owned and giving it to the Lord and killing it? Do you think that was a pleasurable experience? Yes or no? It should be. Because we're giving it to Jesus. We're giving it to God, right? It's a sweet smelling aroma to the Lord. That's literally the term used to describe the, 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 the sacrifice in the Old Testament. A sweet smelling aroma to God. You ever had a barbecue? Smells pretty good, huh? We look at things backwards, don't we? It's a scary thing. It's not supposed to be easy. It's not supposed to be pleasurable or pleasant. But when you recognize now that we get to do something so much better than the Old Testament model, that's why it's again and again in the book of Hebrew described as a better covenant. Now, instead of having to kill the animal that's our most prized possession, we get to give to support the work of salvation in other people's lives and support ministries that are preaching the gospel and making disciples. What would you rather do? For sure that, right? That's way better. There's an old saying, you cannot take it with you. When I was a director at a billion dollar company and dealing with mega rich clients all the time, we would deal with this. You know, we'd have people come in that are worth tens of millions of dollars and more and you know, they would be trying to figure out a way to liquidate their assets so that they could divest themselves more effectively for, you know, preparing for their deaths or whatever. That was a pretty common thing. And a lot of these people were very bitter, very angry. You know why? Because they'd worked their whole lives. They destroyed marriages and abandoned children and screwed over everybody they could to get dollars and dollars and dollars and more dollars. And then they were about to lose everything that their heart was so enamored with because you can't take it with you. But then you think of the Christian model where you've been giving your whole life, trying to build God's kingdom, trying to see people get saved, support the work of ministry, and you're about to die, and you're going into your reward because you know you've been building that kingdom. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead by giving to support the work of ministry. And so those people who are about to die, they would always be happy. You'd have clients sometimes, very rare, but they'd be coming in, they would be looking forward to it. They're like, well, I'm going into my eternal reward instead of your infernal reward, big difference, right? And that makes it so you're happy because where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. And if your treasure is on this earth, are you going to want to lose your treasure? But if your treasure is in heaven, you get to go be with it afterwards, right? But you don't even care. You just want to go be with Jesus. Is Jesus your treasure? Think of Genesis chapter 15. I think it's verses 1 and 2. God tells Abraham to go out and look up at the stars. And he says, I am your shield. He's like, I'll protect you. And he also says this weird thing. He says, I am your exceedingly great reward. I'm your treasure. Is Jesus your treasure? Is Jesus your reward? Or are you, instead, obsessed with that pathetic little three-figure bank balance? You're like, oh, why you got to rub it in? You know, is, is that where your treasure is? Is that where your heart is? Sad, right? Paul's talking to a church that was so poor that it could only occasionally afford to set money aside from the weekly offering to support missions. So, you know, I get it. Sometimes it's not easy to give if you don't have money. I, you know, <laughs> we've eaten at food pantries, got all our kids clothes at garage sales. We've been so poor, it's been insane. But look at what God says there in verse 19. My God shall supply all your need, not your wants, according to his riches. 
if you're supporting the work of ministry, if you're doing what you're supposed to do and giving of your time, your treasure, and your talent, God will supply your needs. You know what the craziest part is? You don't have that if you're not doing that. You don't have that promise. God's like, sorry, man, I had a promise for you. You didn't want to do it. And God can't lie, guys. So invest wisely and have the foresight to make decisions that you won't regret in eternity. Now to our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. This life is all about being a good steward of the things that God has entrusted to us. And if we're really living it out and we're really on fire for Jesus, what's the old saying? Put your money where your mouth is. Interesting thought, right? So congratulations, you guys survived. None of you died, I think. We had two people leave. No, I'm kidding. But we don't talk about money unless it's in the passage, and I don't know how I could teach this passage and be honest to the text without talking about money. So you guys survived, and uh, next week we'll be talking about whatever the passage talks about. So you won't have to hear about money again for a few more years or whatever it is. You can just go on spending all your money on tchotchkes and useless garbage. Congratulations. No, I'm kidding. But God is faithful, and he cannot lie. And the reality is, here's a crazy thought, not so applicable for all you college kids, but the older people, here's the craziest thing, right? They're holding so tight to their money. I know literally pretty much everybody here is a college kid, but for those who aren't, for those who have a ton of money, here's the craziest thought of all. All the money that's left behind after the rapture will be the carrot on the stick that the Antichrist will try to use to get your family to worship him instead of God. That sucks, right? That's a terrible thought, right? Crazy thought, right? They could have, all the rich boomers and you know they could have used the money to like build god's kingdom instead they left it in their 401ks or all these things that you know instead of doing that because they're not watching right they're not noticing oh here it is the time is at hand that's why it's so important that we watch because we'll make decisions accordingly and all that money that people are holding on to so tightly it'll be the carrot on the stick when antichrist is doing distributism and says hey you know get the mark of the beast and uh, you got a house you get a car you get everything we got all this treasure left behind from the people that got raptured. It'll be the carrot on the stick, which Satan will try to use to get your friends and your family to worship him and to go to hell. Crazy thought, right? So let's be good stewards of what God has entrusted to us, our time, our treasure, our talents, so that we don't regret it when we stand in front of him. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And Lord, we pray that we would be good stewards of the resources that you have entrusted to us, Lord. And, Lord, that we wouldn't just give of our time, but also our treasure, Lord, of our talents, Lord, and that our hearts would be fully yours because we know our heart gets tangled up in these things. And for the love of money, many have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And, Lord, we pray that we would love you more than we love money in a practical way that's actually obvious and evident from our lives and that we would look at money like we look at everything else, like a tool that we can use in a good way or in a bad way. And so, Lord, help us not to be slaves of money. Help us to be your slaves because you love us and you gave yourself for us. So, Lord, we love you and we praise you and we worship you and we pray that you would strengthen us through the power of your spirit to do these things. And we pray that you'd bless the time of fellowship that we're going to have now. In Jesus' name, amen. Just survive.